this is how we see you from our point of view. You know, here we are with our great civilization, and it, well, here's what you are doing, which is essentially nothing, you know, um, until we showed up. So we will only tell the story from when we showed up because that's the only relevant starting point. Leopold was so proud of his uh, museum that he put his name everywhere. More than 60 times you can see his name. You see over there, Leopold II, everywhere, even in the yeah. paintings, he puts his name. The outside of the museum. Yes, when I was coming, I saw his crest, his family crest, on top of the museum. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> But he, he, he was the guy who paid for it. Well, he paid, of course, with the money, the money from Congo, but he was a bit proud of it. He wanted to show off with, uh, with what he what he done. I've never actually, believe it, I've never actually been to like an African museum. When I go to museums, it's always been like a part of, Africa's always been a part of a museum. So to have something that's actually just dedicated to this, I think it's good. This museum, for me personally, I. I liked it and I, and, I, and I didn't like it as well. It being in Europe made it easy and accessible for, for me to kind of like go there and see it and stuff like that. And for that reason, I would like it to stay there because there was, my expectation was that I want to go and see and know something about Congo that I don't already know, you know. So seeing these statues and seeing how, these, how it was laid out and so forth, I saw certain things that, you know, and I was made aware of certain things that I probably, probably you know, Things like mask and the art and the craft, I wouldn't really appreciate it day to day. But going there and seeing it, you'd be like, these people were talented. I heard about the museum. So for a long time, I've always heard about the museum. And it was always a place that I'd intended to go. But given my scepticism of Western museums and its portrayal of its former colonial countries and how much of it, how much of the artefacts are actually stolen quote unquote or acquired if you like I, I you know i was just like okay well i'll go at a more convenient time but when then this project came up um i thought okay it's a good time to go and as we were going for group i thought it'd be better in an ideal world yes you may be saying yes it'd be good to have them back but you have to look at the current political and economical situation of the congo before before answering questions like that um, when congo will be ready i will have a space that will be capable of not just exhibiting but looking after and making those things accessible by all means it will be good to have them back mm -hmm. but until that day is, has come i believe that wherever in the world they may be as long as they are secure i, I personally would vote for them to yeah. be there if that place is terrible and so be it because in terrible and i know that if in 20 years time i want to see them they will still be there you know if i want to send them today in the academy the boys are god knows what will happen when 2016 things will go boom and that stage will be lost to not just to Congolese but to humanity forever i think eventually yes they should be returned because that's where they belong and that's the rightful owners if people would like to see them, then they can by all means book a, a plane ticket and go and visit and do the whole tourist thing. However, I don't think Congo is currently politically stable enough for it to be returned with the same kind of value and significance that it was once held. So some of the masks were massive. Mm -hmm. Now imagine if you bring some of these masks back home in your house now yeah. and then your relatives come over, right? What would be, their first impression would be like, eh, that's a looky. Why have you got that looky there for? Do you see what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Oh, don't you know they used to use this for spirits and stuff like that? That's so true. My friend went to Nigeria and she's like, do you want something? And I was like, maybe like a little statue or something. And she got me back one of those things. <laughs> as soon as I tried to bring it to my house, my dad was like, it's all back. Take that back. Like. Well, I'm definitely interested in, in the artifacts themselves. 
But what's interesting is some of the narrative that's been told about the art, the artifacts is a bit different from what I've read in other, other, um, other research and other books. For instance, a lot of it is some of the masks are being associated to spirits or witchcraft and so on and so on. When it, not all of it is like that. There are some that are like that, but not all of it is like that. But it's almost, what's interesting particularly is all of the um, majority of the artifacts are told from a Eurocentric point of view, from how they understood it. And it's not necessarily told from the perspective of uh, from the Congolese explaining their own narrative, this is what we used it for. We got that big boat, that big pirogue that was about 60 meters long, that you see there and you're thinking, wow, look at the size of that. And yet, and you're thinking, wow, I mean, those people could build, yeah, that floats and all that is for a chief. But then you ask the question, how did they make it? Nothing. Silence. That like, intake tools. You have to understand flotation. You have to understand the right property of the wood for it to be able to float. It takes some sort of knowledge, some sort of practice. How did they get there? And I think it's also that absence that makes you forget the actual item. Yeah. Because if, like, it's, it's nice to see a nice pretty picture or a nice pretty object or an amazing like structure, but if you don't have the information to back, like, to feed your mind with it, you don't remember it because it's just a nice thing. You just forget about it, you move on. I think that the museum should be um, reconsidered significantly. And if it were an empty space with no artifacts in it and, and no uh, historical narrative at all, that would be more useful than what it, what it currently is. You come to this place expecting to gain knowledge. And there again, you find that being taken away or withheld from you is like, that's not for you to see. And it's just like, well, I've traveled a long way to see something, to get something. And I'm feeling again, left empty handed. All of those masks, I remember when I asked about the date and they said the policy was the same as it was before. Give as little information as possible. They're not lying. The mask is Congolese, it's there. It came from this tribe. How old it is, we don't know. We don't know whether it was made in the 1960s or whether it was made in 1400. We don't know whether that mask was for healing or it was for war. We don't know whether it was by, you know, you, whether it got here given away as a gift or whether it was taken as the town was raided or whether it was, you know, we don't know. But we have a mask there. How am I supposed to appreciate that mask with only a name and a date? You know, and, that's, and that really was the theme current throughout my whole trip in Belgium, from Teveren to the city itself. I found interesting to see like, a few things, a few objects, a few artifacts I found interesting to see, but it, within the context of how it was shown, I just could not agree with it. So by that time, I was just like, <laughs> I, I just don't, I don't like what I'm seeing. I like the objects, I like, I like where it's come from, but I don't like how it's got here, and I don't like how it's been shown. One of the things that I like, or should I say, that I picked up from the museum and also from Belgium in general is that um, there is this skill or art of dissimulating the truth by just saying the part that's convenient. And that's very dangerous because when I walked into Teveren, and to be fair, you could say that about any museum in the world, as, as, much, as much of a great of a place of knowledge that a museum is, unless the person before walking in is pre-educated or pre-informed about what they're going to see, if they just walk in and out with the little information available there, they can completely miss out or misunderstand everything that is put in front of them and can completely disregard the value of the object. And that's something that really annoyed me at the end of my visit in Teheran. It's not so much what they put in, is what they hid from the people. Leopold manages to get that huge country because he has his representatives going to the villages and they told the people the white king, Leopold, will protect you if you sign this paper, if you sell your grounds 
to King Leopold. I didn't really know it was a post-colonial museum. I think that's kind of lost on a lot of people. People think, oh, it's a museum back on go. So you're coming to you're coming to view it in a particular light, and then you come there like, oh, what's this? <laughs> what's this propaganda about? <laughs> one, one, where it was like a full length, like a woman, in it? No, no, it was a, it was two men. It was a full length. A uh, Belgian man in like a robe, mm. and it was half. a half child size. <laughs> child size Congolese man, mm. not child. It was a man, and he stayed. It was a man, and this is him showing how he's um, the savior. He's going to bring the, <laughs> the food and the the civilization, and he's going to make everything better. And I was like, oh, okay. Again, you know. Belgium bringing civilization to Congo. It just all pandered to the powers of colonialism. And I think that's what it just tried to make colonialism look like a really good thing. And I, I didn't agree with that. I think the propaganda was quite obvious and the fact that it's not really questioned, I think, by Belgian people, Western people, people globally, it's just, it's kind of says a lot. Mais ça donne aussi l'impression, euh, ce qu'on critique souvent en Afrique, de dire que l'Afrique n'avance pas dans l'histoire mais qu'elle tourne en rond. Quand on ne date pas les objets, on ne voit pas l'évolution. Comme euh, tout à l'entrée, je ne sais pas si vous avez vu euh, un, une statue en train d'allumer du feu. Alors ça, ça a été mis ici en 1930 et ça a été mis comme ça. Comme on disait, un enfant qui regarde ça ne sait pas si en Afrique c'est toujours comme ça aujourd'hui ou ça c'était en 1800 et quelques et maintenant ça a changé. Donc on a l'impression que l'Afrique qu'on nous montre ici aujourd'hui, comme c'est pas daté, donc ça pourrait toujours être comme ça en fait. C'est figé. Si ils font un nouveau piece de travail, peut-il s'il vous plaît être en gold Donc so au moins nous pouvons sentir un sens de valeur. Parce que si vous regardez les autres statues des guerriers africains et ainsi de suite, les couleurs sont noires, 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 it's that simple contrast that you can't miss that out and even even as a child you can see that that's what that's what matters the most to me someone who's five years old is not going to be able to um, take on the historical context and read all the texts and so on and so forth what are we put in the minds of a, the, the young children that are going to walk through these doors a leopard guy standing over another congolese in a very kind of predatory manner I think kind of just lends, further lends to the, um, you know, false claim of tribalism, you know, Congolese versus Congolese, etc. I don't particularly like it. I think it was something that was more created for kind of Belgian, European fandom of uh, tribal myths and there's this man and leopard kid who runs around and does all these things in the middle of the night etc. I wasn't particularly interested in it in, in a deeper kind of sense that I could connect to but I think if it, it meant more for Belgian people than it did for Congolese people. It's so ironic moving all the way out here and I had to ask myself how many Congolese people even live near here? how many Congolese people work within this place. And second of all, we was not given any information about how we, as diasporic Congolese people, can contribute to the sustaining that legacy within such an institution, which I think is probably the most important aspect of the trip. With the visitors that are around, that's excluding us, I only saw one African person, and it was a kid. He didn't have his parents. Why is there no like kind of discourse about this museum, not only in Belgium but also around the world? Moi, je me pose toujours la question de savoir qui est dans le conseil d'administration. Parce que s'il n'y a que des anciens colons, c'est normal en fait qu'on retrouve cet esprit-là et que ça ait du mal à, à changer. In regards to the, the visit to the museum, I'm glad we actually did get to go before it closed. I think that was necessary. Um, but I do hope that when it does reopen, it at least improves significantly, and not just a little bit. Like, it, there needs to be a significant 
noticeable improvement in both its presentation and its narrative across the whole museum. Otherwise, there's just no point. There's no point closing down for three years, is it? And then opening it up and it's only a little bit better. That's really, really not good enough mm -hmm. cons uh, considering the fact that there is so much, you know, so many resources and so much literature out there about the true narrative. A lot of countries don't want to show their, they don't want to show the worst aspects of their history, you know, to, they would prefer to just show and be like, oh, maybe like, you know, Nazis, yes, that's an isolated case of one country. That's a, there, I think there is a reason why, especially British history, when you're young, the only thing on the syllabus that is uh, compulsory in history is World War Two. But yet colonisation is not talked about. But how are you going to talk about World War II that lasted for, what, six years, but colonisation that lasted for 60 years, you're going to like, completely not make that relevant in your syllabus? Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I think that's very telling of a lot of countries. They don't want to put their dirty laundry out there. Who, who doesn't, like, fantasise about back in the day when they were the most powerful, when they were at their greatest, even though their greatest was achieved by so many killings? The very frustrating thing about this museum is that it shows too little. And that's why I say don't destroy it, because destroying it means that we won't know what we're hiding. And I think to me is what's hidden that's really, really frustrating because I come a long way to see a lot and I feel like I didn't see enough.